So to start out today, um, this is Memorial Day weekend, and it's, uh, it's one that hits particularly close to home uh, here at Crosswinds. Um, for those of you who don't know, a week and a half ago, uh, one of our young men who um, uh, goes here and their families here today uh, passed away a week and a half ago. He was a, a Marine, and, um, and we just want to take some time to honor him and his family and, and all the, the veterans who have given their lives for our freedom and, and uh, so that we can do this, so that we can come to church, that we can worship God without fear of, of uh, persecution and uh, the freedoms that they have given up. So the family uh, wants to invite you all to his, uh, his service, his memorial service. It'll be here at the church. There's a info on the screen there if you want to take a picture, but um, it would mean a lot if you can attend. And, um, and we just want to honor him and the family. So it's on Tuesday. Uh, the viewing is at 9.30 a.m. here at the church. The service is at 10.30 and then uh, the committal service is at Riverside National Cemetery at 12.30. So I want to take a moment just to pray for the, the Valdez family, um, Elijah, who is with Jesus now, and uh, all, all the veterans who have given their life for our freedom. So please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, we, we, we're just so grateful um, for the sacrifices that um, these men and women in our country have made um, for us, Lord, that you have used them so that we can come before you without fear of uh, persecution, Lord, that we can come and worship you on a Sunday morning, Lord, and all the other freedoms that come with, uh, with their sacrifice, Lord. We, we thank you for, for using them, Lord, and that we don't take it lightly and that we want to honor them well, Lord. I just pray that we would be a comfort to the families, um, and particularly the Valdez family this morning, Lord. Um, we're, we're grateful that Elijah is with you, Lord. And, uh, and that we have that, uh, as we read in First Thessalonians, that you will return, and when you come, you, he will be with you. And we are looking forward to that day. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are in the last uh, portion of First Thessalonians. This is the last week we are finishing the book. So I, I, first of all, I want to thank you so much for all the prayers and the encouragement I've received over the last seven weeks. This has been a, a huge learning experience for me. I, I've really enjoyed it, and, and uh, you have all been a, a huge encouragement, and I, I truly appreciate all the prayers. So I just want to thank you first for that. And as we're, we're wrapping up, um, next week we are having a missionary join us. I encourage you all to be here uh, for that. And then Trenton will be preaching through the rest of June uh, until Pastor Willie returns from his sabbatical. And I'm particularly excited about that because Trenton, he's a brand new father and he's going to be preaching on Father's Day. So he's going he's gonna to school all you old, old dads and tell you how it's really done. So, um, so I'm looking forward to that, to seeing all his wisdom shine on stage. So um, <laughs> I have no room to talk. So um, uh, but uh, it, it's been an exciting book, and I've, I've really uh, enjoyed studying it and being able to come up here and share what the Lord has been showing me as we've gone through First Thessalonians. And if you're wondering when I'm going to do Second Thessalonians, don't worry. Pastor Willie will be on his next sabbatical in seven years. So mark your calendar, and we'll go through Second Thessalonians in seven years. So look forward to that. I, I'm looking forward to it. Um, but yeah, let's, let's, as we get into it, uh, Dear Thessalonica is the name of the series. And as we've been going week by week, we've been kind of writing out this letter, just little portions of it. And I, I kind of want to put it all together now. So uh, it, uh, each, um, each different message, I've had a different title for it. So uh, put it all together, it's kind of a poorly put together letter, but I thought it was clever at the time when I was putting it together. <laughs> but let's read through it and just kind of remind ourselves where we've been through this book and what Paul has been discussing with the Thessalonians, his memories of them and the instruction he's provided for them, and, and uh, just ultimately push, uh, pointing to Christ's return. So our very first uh, message was called, uh, You Are Always in Our Thoughts. And the main focus of that passage was just that Paul 
was he separated from the Thessalonians, and he just was thinking about them constantly. He was in another mission field, but he was worried about them. He, he was remembering how they were brand new Christians, but how on fire they were when he first got there. And he, even though he had to leave them quickly, he just saw so much growth, and he was starting to hear rumblings that, like, they're doing really well, but he was still concerned about them, which brings us to our, our next uh, uh, sermon, which was, you are very dear to us. This is where Paul is kind of recounting like his, when he was with them and what his ministry looked like, how he approached the Thessalonians, how he uh, made sure that he treated them like newborn children, that he was taking care of them, that he wasn't asking anything from, uh, for return, that he was earning the reputation that he needed to earn to, uh, for them to listen to him. He was uh, making sure he was working hard, that um, there was nothing in the way of him sharing the gospel, that he was getting out of the way of the gospel, that everything that he did was, it didn't bring any light to him, that they could only see what Jesus had done for them. And that brings us to our, our next uh, part, and this is where Paul, this kind of um, expresses why Paul wrote this book in the first place. We hope to see you soon. And this is where Paul is saying, I, I was really worried about you guys when I left. I, I saw the persecution coming. You were brand new in your face. I was worried, and I just needed to get back to you. I needed to find out how you were doing. I was worried. I was having a hard time focusing in my other mission fields. He wrote this when he was in uh, Corinth. And he sent Timothy, his disciple, to go check on them. And then when Timothy returned, he had a good report. He said, the Thessalonians are doing great, and you have nothing to worry about. They're doing way better than we ever anticipated. And just the relief that he felt from that, like he said, okay, I can relax. I still want to get to you. I still want to hold you, and now that I know you're okay, but now I can relax, and I can just trust God when he wants me to go back to Thess Thessalonica. I, I, I can do it in his time timing without having to worry. And then our next message was stay out of trouble. And that was where he said, okay, now that I know you're safe, let's get back into instruction. You're still a new church, and I want to just make sure you're all doing well. I know I didn't have much time with you, so I want to touch on some topics. So first he said, I, you guys are doing great from what I've heard. You've really taken what I taught you and really applied it to your life and, and doing way better than I anticipated. Now here's something that'll trip you up. Uh, sexual immorality will really trip you up in your faith with God. If you yeah, and that was a huge part of their culture in Thessalonica. So be careful of that. You guys are on such a good road. Do not um, stray from God's design for sexuality. If you, if you go into sexual immorality, that's going to trip you up. And, and finally, I hear your brotherly love is like off the charts. I didn't even teach you about that. Who told you about brotherly love? I didn't teach you that. Uh, it must have been God. So, uh, and just knowing that God is taking care of the Thessalonians, even if Paul didn't teach them about how to properly love each other in the church, they got it down. God had that covered. So uh, stay out of trouble because Jesus is coming back. And this is where uh, he's instructing them on some of their worries. They're a brand new church, brand new believers. They didn't get all the theology down, the understanding of uh, all of Christianity. They got the basics down. They understood that Jesus was their Lord and Savior, so they were saved. They just didn't understand the mechanics of his second coming. And that's where he goes over that in, in that part. Jesus is coming back. And when he comes back, he's bringing those who have died in Christ with him. And that was their concern. It's like, wait, what happens to those who have already died when Jesus returns? Will they get to partake in the kingdom? And he's saying, yes, their souls are with Jesus now. And when he returns, they will be with him. And then we will meet them in the sky. So he, he just explained that Jesus is coming back. So keep an eye out. And that was last week's message. That's where he, he said, so Jesus is coming back. Obviously, your question is when? And the answer is, I don't know. Nobody knows. So keep an eye out, like uh, make sure that you're living a life that is holy and pleasing to God because when he shows up, you don't know the time or the hour. You don't want to, him to catch you not doing his will. You want him to find you doing what he's called you to do. And that brings us to today, today's final message. This is the first one I wrote. Uh, I, I worked backwards. So, um, so keep an eye out and here it comes. Drive safely, make good choices.
Now, uh, that's kind of an inside joke with the young adult. If, uh, if you're a part of the young adults, you know where that comes from. It, it's uh, at the end of the night, uh, Riley always says to someone who's saying, okay, I'm leaving, she always says, drive safely, make good choices. Th that's just her, her greeting. Everyone loves it. We all laugh. We have a great time, uh, fun all around. But um, drive safely, make good choices. Kind of the, the, the point of that is that uh, these are just kind of the final thoughts. These aren't the things that he specifically wrote the letter for, but they're still valuable. They're kind of like your mom saying, oh, remember to wash behind your ears, make sure you're eating, uh, take a shower, those kind of things. They're like all valuable things. It's just like final thoughts, like squeezing them in right before the end of the letter. Not the purpose of the letter, but valuable, a part of scripture and, and uh, profitable for all things. So that's what we're going to get into today. Some of these things, are things he's kind of touched on earlier in the book. Some of these things are brand new things that he brings up, and, and some of them are things that he's going to readdress in, in 2 Thessalonians, things that he touches on a little bit here on the end, but he, you, you see that oh, the Thessalonians, when he gets to the second book, he's saying, okay, you guys really need a little more instruction on this, so we'll get back to that in the second book. So that's kind of the, the overview of what we've gone through. So let's get into this week's passage, the drive safely, make good choices. So uh, the, first, um, the first point is that Paul is giving final instructions regarding leaders. And let's uh, open up in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians 5, and we'll do 12 through 13 first. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you, and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace amongst yourselves. So the, this is kind of, in, he's instructing them how to address their leaders in the church. That would be pastors and elders. And the first thing he says here is respect who labor among you. And what I grab out of that and what I see there is he's, he's saying your local church pastor, the person you are um, laboring with. This is a very personal, intimate uh, thing he's calling you to do. And, and it's something that I, I think is relevant to us because as we get more technologically advanced and as our culture changes, we become a little more independent. We, we don't, uh, there's a temptation to say, oh, I could just stay at home and watch online, or I have my favorite, uh, you know, mega church pastor that I can watch online, or, or I have a favorite devotional, and I can kind of do Christianity on my own. I can kind of minister to my world on my own. And, and this is where I, I, we need to know that church must be done uh, together and that we need those above us guiding us, directing us, pastors and elders who are laboring among us, that they're not just like uh, over us and, and telling us what to do like I am right now. I'm literally over you telling you what to do. No, that, that when we go out into our worlds, that when we are doing ministry together, we are, we are one with Christ, that we are uh, working together, laboring together, that we know each other, that your pastor knows your name, your elders knows your name, that we are working and laboring together. That, and with, what comes with that is a little bit of uh, an uncomfortable situation in that they, they know your name. They know you. They, they know your sins. They get to know you, and it, it's a, you can't hide. And that's, that's a scary thing, but that's what we want we really want, if we want to grow in Christ, that we, we want to grow with Jesus and go to our worlds. And for that to happen, we need accountability. We need elders and pastors over us to guide us, to look after us, to make sure that we are on the right path. And sometimes that's uncomfortable. Sometimes that brings um, uh, admonishment, is what it says here. So let's look at some passages about the word admonish. Uh, admonish is kind of like a it's not like a, a, a discipline or an angry kind of thing. It's more of a, a warning or a gentle correction. And why, why do we want admonishment? Why do we want someone like a pastor or elder to be looking after us and making sure that when we get off track, that they're gently coming to us and saying, hey, uh, can you explain this to me? Or what's going on in this situation? You know, I'm a little concerned because I, out of love. And there, there's two aspects. It's, it's for those of us who are believers and maybe are a little uncomfortable with admonishment, uh, let's see what Proverbs says, 12.1. 
Whoever loves discipline, discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates reproof is stupid. I, I love how blunt that is. <laughs> Last week, I, there was a passage that said, like, oh, and the master will cut the slave in the, the, to pieces. And I'm like, I love that. And I was like, that doesn't sound good. But sometimes the scripture is just so blunt and, and honest with us. But he who hates reproof is stupid. And, and that's just saying that if we really want to grow, if we really want to develop in our Christian walk, we should value when someone points something out in our life that may, we may be hiding, we may be aware of, and saying, oh, don't look at that. I, don't get too close to me because I, I have this thing I don't want you to be involved in. Or maybe something that we're blind to. Maybe we have a blind spot in our life that's an area of sin or struggle that we, we just aren't aware of. And, and having someone, whether it be an elder or a pastor or just a fellow in our church, um, a, a fellow believer, uh, come up to us and say, hey, uh, let's talk about this. I, I'm a little concerned. Can we, can we discuss this in, in love? It's not a, an angry thing or it's, it, we're to do it gently. And also, we need to look at the heart of the, the person who's doing the admonishing. And that, we see that in Proverbs 13, 24. Whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. And we, we just need to recognize, yes, there are abusive leaders. There are leaders who are on power trips, pastors and elders who, who want to control uh, their congregation and the people and make them conform to their idea of ministry or whatever that is. But this is the, the real model that uh, a church leader should have over the church. This isn't something that we want to do. This is something we do out of love and care for each other, that the, the pastors and elders are, are doing this out of love for their congregants, that they see something in their life that needs correction because they know that it's ultimately going to be damaging, and it's done out of love even though it, it's honestly uncomfortable for the pastor. It's uncomfortable for the elder to address this, uh, but they do it out of love. L let's look at uh, Hebrews, uh, the next passage, Hebrews 13, 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are watching over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. A and See, this is something that it's not a, a, a thing of pleasure for an elder or a pastor to admonish someone in the church. This is something that they're, they're doing out of love, but also necessity because they have, uh, they're going to account for what they did with the, their flock, the people in their church, the people they're looking after, the people they are laboring with. And when God says, hey, you saw that issue in that younger believer's life, what did you do? Did you ignore it? Were you too harsh about it? Did you shut them down and drive them out of the church? Or did you gently come to them and, and address it in love, letting them know that I, uh, I, I care for you. This is for you. I, it, it, it's uh, uncomfortable for both of us, but let's come together and work at this. And for, for the, uh, the person who's receiving admonishment, it's important for you to know that that's the heart of a pastor or an elder when they come to you, that they're not doing this to rule it over you. And if you can, it's uncomfortable, yes, but if you can receive it knowing that loving the discipline that they're bringing, that you don't argue with them or fight with them, maybe it is a misunderstanding and you just need to talk it out. But if it is sin that needs to be addressed, just recognizing that it's done out of love and that it's to restore you, that it's good for you ultimately, even if it's uncomfortable. So for the joy of the, the pastor and the elder, uh, there are people who will fight back against them and make their lives difficult. But if it ever happens to you, out of love for them, please come to them, not with groaning, but with joy, loving the discipline they're bringing and making their lives uh, uh, a joy so that they can win their brother back, as scripture says. So um, it, it's a hard job being a pastor. It's a hard job being an elder. And if you can be cooperative with them and loving with them and patient with them, because they make mistakes too, and just sorting these things out, working through it in love, then that is what makes the church grow. It, it makes 
unity in the church. It's when we deal with these hard things in the way that God calls us to do it that um, the church func functions with joy. And hard things come up. We all sin. We all need admonishment. And just accepting that with grace and humility is the way that we do that. And I want to highlight this because um, next week we have communion. And a, a major part of communion is our, our unity in the church. We are, we are communing with God and each other. And if we go to the communion table and there's not unity in the church, if there's not unity with each other, with our, our pastors and elders, if there's a fighting and groaning, then we're coming to the, the communion table in an unworthy manner. And we have a, a week before we meet there. So I encourage you, if there's anyone in the church that you need to get things right with, if you need to sit down and say, hey, maybe there's this open conflict, or maybe there's this uh, maybe a, a tension that I sense, but I'm not quite sure what that is. Can we talk about it? And just work that out. And, and that's how we can come together in unity to the communion table. So I encourage you to, to do that. Don't plan to skip communion next week because there's disunity in the church. Plan to come uh, united with your brothers and sisters in Christ. So that's what I want to encourage you to, and, and that also leads into our next um, part of the passage, which is uh, regarding each other. So that was how, how do we interact with leaders? How do we respect them and make their lives easier, making sure that um, we're uh, submitting to them, recognizing the great responsibility that they have over us, that they're going to make an account for our souls, that they're guiding us and leading us with wisdom. And now uh, our responsibility to hold each other accountable and to take care of each other and to love love each other. So let's look at 1 Thessalonians uh, 14 through 15. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle. There's that word again, admonish. Encourage the faint-hearted. Help the weak. Be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. So this is something that the Thessalonians have down really well. But Paul said in an earlier passage that they understood brotherly love, that there wasn't a great sense of infighting that we see in, in, in this uh, letter, that uh, they, they loved each other well. They took care of the, the faint-hearted, uh, uh, the weak, um, uh, loving each other, being patient with each other, not repaying evil for evil, but seeking to do good for one another. So I want to I wanna zero in on this word admonish again because it came up again. And, and this time it's to the idol. And I want to focus on that a little bit more because it comes up again in 2 Thessalonians. So there's a sense that like he, he's kind of finishing the letter talking about admonish the idol, but he spends a whole lot more time on it in 2 Thessalonians. So there's a sense that this is an issue in the church, and then he's like, okay, you guys aren't getting this, so I really need to talk about it in our second book. So uh, second letter. So I want to take some time and look what he has to say to the Thessalonians and, and really define what is this idleness that is seeping into the church in Thessalonica, and, and I, I believe in America as well. So let's look at 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 through 15. It's a longer passage, so. Uh, now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with toil and labor we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you, it was not because we do not have the right, but to, give you in, uh, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even though we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busybodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him, that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. 
And that warn is like admonish. And then uh, Galatians 6.1, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too uh, be tempted. So it, it, there's a harsh command at the end of that part in, in 2 Thessalonians. is like, have nothing to do with him. But what it's saying there is, avoid temptation, avoid falling into the same trap that they're in. You are going to them to say, you need this correction, and I'm not going to participate in it. You're still my brother. You still, I still love you. I want to see um, you grow from this, but I'm not going to help you in this. I'm not going to, if you're uh, lying around all day, I'm not going to uh, give you money or, or make food for you if you're being idle. Now, we all go through hard times. We, we, we recognize that. We all need help from each other. That's not what it's talking about. It's not talking about someone who's lost their job and hasn't found one yet, or, or someone who's uh, going through difficulties, depression, struggles, or anything like that. It's talking about people who are just lazy, just <laughs> people who really need to be going out and, and, and being busy about the work of either uh, working for themselves or just working for the Lord, just not sitting around doing nothing. And it, I brought this up because it, it just highlights what Paul had really been emphasizing to the Thessalonians. For some reason, in some churches, he would go there and he would let them support him. He would go there and let them feed him, let them pay for his things, let them house him. But for whatever reason, when he got to Thessalonica, he says, I'm not going to let you guys take care of me. I'm going to work. I'm going to show you an example of a hard worker. I'm going to earn everything that I get here at this, uh, in this city. And, and we see this, we, we see why he did this, because this is a church that's struggling with the idleness, that people aren't pulling their weight. They're not doing their fair share. And other churches, they didn't have that problem. He would let them support him. But he needed to set this example for this church. And, and it's, it's just emphasized so much more in the second book of Thessalon Thessalonica that this is the example they needed. They needed to see that Christians need to be hardworking people in their community. That it is a bad example to our worlds when we are relying on others and not pulling our own weight. When we're, not, uh, when we're lazy, when we waste our time doom scrolling on Instagram or TikTok, when we're, we're just uh, binging Netflix, when, when there's work to be done, when if we're asking for people to help us, but we're not putting in the effort uh, to, to do what needs to be done. And I don't want to shame anyone if, if you're in a position that um, it, you're, you're going through something and you need the support. And even the people who are, let's say, lazy and, and, and just need that encouragement, we do it gently, as it says in Galatians there, in gentleness. We're not shaming them. We're not saying, oh, you millennials, you're all so lazy. We're, we're, we're going to them, and, and we're not assuming their motives. We're not assuming their motives either. We don't know what's going on in their lives. We don't know what they're feeling, what struggles they're having right then. And we go to them in love and saying, how's it going? I, I notice you haven't been at work lately. I, I've noticed um, uh, you, you've been online a lot. I've noticed that you're, you're just kind of floating around. Is everything okay? How can I support you? How can I love you? And, and, and maybe help them find that job. Maybe they need that encouragement. Maybe they've, they've lost jobs and they're feeling that hopelessness and they're giving up. That's where the church can really come in and shine, is to show them love, uh, help them find a job, and, and making sure that they're not being idle. Because in that idleness is when evilness starts to, to bloom. The idle hands, is, uh, idle hands are the devil's play thing or play work. I don't know. I should have looked it up first. But, uh, <laughs> but this idleness produces uh, busybodies, uh, people who are gossiping and tearing others down and, and, and just not, uh, they have nothing else to do. And that's just where Satan grabs a hold of someone's life. That, and it's when you're not earning your own keep, there's that inner sense of, of shame and, and guilt that um, you, you, it's just Satan breeds uh, sin in that. And we want to be careful of that and make sure that's not there. And we need to encourage each other. So I spent a lot of time on that, but I, I, it, 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 it was a struggle for the Thessalonians. And I think it's a struggle here in America. And 
Again, we as brothers and sisters need to love each other and help each other with all these struggles. So moving on um, to uh, point number three, uh, he, in, he instructs them regarding joy. This is the fun passage. This is the, uh, it, it's in everyone's bios. We, we love this passage. It's uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And we do this because we remember what Jesus did for us. We remember that he died on the cross for us. We, we remember that he, we have eternal life because of what he did for us, but also are reminded of what Paul just talked about in previous chapters, that we're looking forward to his return, and that we, 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 we have been saved from death in the past, and we're looking forward to life, eternal life in the future. So we go forward in all circumstances. We pray and we give thanks uh, in all circumstances. And not all circumstances are good. There's a lot of pain in this world. There's a lot of suffering. This church is going through a lot right now, a lot of pain. But we know that God is good, that he's working in all of it. Let's look at Psalms 10, 1 through 5. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. And we can give thanks to God because it says right there, he is good. Everything that happens in our lives, we know we have a shepherd who is good, who loves us, who's caring for us, that the circumstances in this world uh, will, will hurt us, uh, will, we don't understand it. it, it breaks us, but we have a loving father, a good shepherd who is good, and his steadfast love endures forever, that we who are, are in Christ will be loved by a good God forever, and that no matter what we're going through, obviously it's going to hurt. It's going to take time of mourning, but knowing that ultimately he is working all things for good for those of us who love him and are called according to his purpose. So we, we move forward. Uh, Philippians 4, 6 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, give th- with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So you're praying without ceasing. You're praying to God, just letting him know, Lord, this is what's going on in my life. Can you help me with this? Lord, uh, guide me through this. And knowing that he is a good shepherd and that he's going to take care of it. Whether we understand the way he takes care of it or not, whether he handles it in a way we would prefer or not, we know he is good and that his love endures forever, forever. And whatever he is doing, that it will be for our good. So uh, the next point is regarding the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. So the first two points were about uh, dealing with um, other believers, and the second two points are are about um, our interactions with God, that we come to Him with thanksgiving and joy and love, and now we look at the Holy Spirit. And uh, uh, so let's read 19 through 22. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophecies. But test everything, hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. And uh, the Holy Spirit is, is kind of the, the mysterious uh, part of the Trinity. He, he's just as much God, but we often talk a little bit more about Jesus or God. And, and the Holy Spirit is, well, what exactly is he? And how does he interact in our lives? And it says here, do not quench the Spirit. What does that mean? How, how do I uh, quench the Spirit? And uh, if you remember last week, uh, last week was 50 days after Easter. So it, that is known as Pentecost Sunday. And in, when Jesus uh, rose from the dead, 50 days later, the, the, all Christians received the Holy Spirit. They were empowered by the Holy Spirit. And in that time, they went out and started preaching the gospel and speaking in tongues by the power of the Holy Spirit. They were speaking in languages that others did not understand, but the Holy Spirit translated it so they could understand. 
And when that happened, they thought they were drunk. Like all the people in the land, like who was hearing them speak in these foreign tongues and they were understanding, they were saying they must be drunk. There's something weird going on here. But Peter says, no, they are not drunk. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, let, let's read uh, Acts 2, 16 through 21, where that happens. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And what Peter's talking about here, what this is prophesied from uh, uh, Joel in the Old, Old Testament, he's talking about what he's been talking about in, um, to the Thessalonians. The day that the Lord returns, that there will be prophesying, that, that believers will be prophesying. So we shouldn't reject it, that this is a gift of the Holy Spirit, but we are to test it. There's, there's warnings also in the, the end times. There's that the Holy Spirit will be empowering us to prophesy, but also the enemy will be at work and there will be false prophecies. Um, Jesus in Matthew uh, 24, 11 says, and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. So we, we know in the end times, there's going to be a lot of prophesying. There's going to be the, the Holy Spirit empowered prophecies, and we shouldn't reject those. We shouldn't meet them with suspicion, but we should test them because there will be a lot of false prophecies. We talked about this a little last week where um, people were prophesying about when Jesus would come. Uh, they, they said he's going to come in 1988 or, they, uh, or a thousand years ago or in, in uh, 50 years from now. All these prophecies are being made. So how do we distinguish between the Holy Spirit empowered prophecies and prophecies that are false from the enemy? And we, uh, I, I'm sure there's many ways to do it, but I see two ways to distinguish uh, what is a true prophecy and what is false. And one is that it must agree with the Bible. It cannot contradict the Bible, whatever the prophecy is. And that's where the Thessalonians could use some help. Uh, and th this is why Paul is telling them to do that. Because in Acts 17.11, it says, um, after Paul had left uh, Thessalonica, he went to the Bereans. And this is what it says about the Bereans in Acts 17. Now, these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness. They didn't quench the spirit, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. So they received it with eagerness. They didn't quench the spirit, but they also tested it. They went to the scriptures to verify what Paul was saying was true. And that's where the Thessalonians fell short. If we're not testing, if you're not testing what I'm saying up here, you're, you're just as bad as the Thessalonians. You, you need to know scripture. You need to go and see what I'm saying. Is it true to this? Can you find what I'm saying in here? And if not, then, well, please don't stone me. I, I don't think I'm a false prophet, but please come to me in love and, and correct me. But, but know that anything you hear, any prophecy, anything taught from the word, you need to test it. You need to be familiar with what God's word says so that you won't be led astray by a false prophecy. And the other thing um, to keep an eye out is, oh, I, I covered them both in one. Nice. Two for one. Okay. It, it, it's uh, to, to test the scripture. Oh, and the other is, does it come true? When uh, a prophecy is, is made, uh, if, if it doesn't come true, it's obviously a false prophecy. So the 1988 uh, prophecy that Jesus returned, that was a false prophecy. And when he made the prediction they'd come back in 1989, if you fell for it, I don't know what to say to you. You're, you're, you're a little too gullible, and I'll pray for you. But... Um, but those are the two things. Check Scripture and see if it's true, what they have to say. If it agrees with Scripture but doesn't come true, it's a false prophecy. But at least you're, you're, you're trusting that the Holy Spirit is alive and working in our world. And that prophecies still do happen. That we're looking forward and we know that the good ones are coming, but also being weary of the bad ones. And our final point is our final farewells. 
this is just kind of wrapping up the letter. We, we've been in this, this letter for seven weeks, and this is just Paul, just like his final thoughts, what he's putting out there. So let's read 23 through 24 first. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. And the question is, are you ready? Are you ready for him to return? Will he find you blameless, body, soul, spirit? And if you don't know, if you don't know what that means, we have a, th a, um, a tool we use here called the ABCs, or in Spanish, the ACEs. You're an ace at the gospel if you get these right. And the ABCs, it's easy as ABC. And, and how we explain it is uh, to be saved, to know that when Jesus returns, that you will be with him in paradise, that he will take you with him, is first you have to admit. You have to admit that you are in need of a savior, that you fall short, fall short of the glory of God, that um, there's nothing you can do to save yourself, that you are a sinner, and that he is a holy, perfect God, and he cannot be with sinners for eternity. And, and we're left in this state of, of brokenness, and we can't save ourselves. But we believe. We believe that he sent his only perfect son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross and raise from the dead for our sins. We believe, creer, that when we believe that, that we know that he made the way, that we can be right with him, that we can accept his blood, and, and, um, and that we can be with Christ for eternity. And the final step, you can believe it, but if you don't accept it, if you don't, uh, let's see again. Choose, choose, thank you. <laughs> it's easy as ABC and I forget C somehow, okay. I've been doing this for my whole, okay. Uh, choose, if you don't choose, to make him your Lord and Savior. You can believe it, but if you're saying, I believe it, but I'm not interested. It's like Noah and the flood. Like, you believe the flood's coming, but are you going to get on the boat? Uh, are you making that choice to make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, to accept that gift that he has given you, to follow him? Uh, will you make that choice? And that's, that's up to you, and that's where the Holy Spirit will convict your heart. If you feel uh, a, a uh, that conviction right now, that's the Holy Spirit convicting you, drawing you to him. He wants you to come and know a, a saving faith in Jesus Christ. He wants you to be with him in paradise for all eternity. So don't ignore that. Don't quench the spirit when, if he's speaking to you right now. And if that's the case, you can make that decision right now. You can say, Jesus, I choose you as my Lord and Savior. I believe that you were that perfect sacrifice. And it, if you've made that choice, then you are saved. That when Jesus returns, you will go with him. That you will be in eternity forever with him because of you have accepted the gift, the sacrifice that he made for you. And if you made that choice, please come up front after the service. Our elders and I will be up front, and we'd love to pray for you. We'd love to uh, celebrate with you and, and let you know what comes next, what, what it means for him to be your Lord and Savior. So uh, wrapping up, we, we just have these kind of final, uh, quick little um, goodbyes uh, that he's just kind of wrapping up the message. Uh, brothers, pray for us. Um, he, he's the Apostle Paul, but he needs your prayer too. We are all equal in Christ. We have different stations, like we have different responsibilities, different gifting, but in God's eyes, we are all equal. And your pastors and your elders need your prayer just as much as uh, you need their prayer. So pray for them. Paul is asking, the Apostle Paul is asking for the prayer of these brand new Thessalo uh, Thessalonian um, believers. He valued their prayer. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. This one makes me uncomfortable. I don't... <laughs> And, and I, I, I want to, it, it's a cultural thing, but I don't want to be so quick to say this was their culture. I, I, if this is what God is telling us to do, and it says it in uh, four other, uh, I, I see four other verses throughout the Bible in Romans, 1 Corinthians, and 1 Peter. It says to greet each other with a holy kiss. And I, I don't want to be so quick to say, oh, it's cultural, we don't have to do that. Um, but I, that's a conclusion I'm going to come to, but I, 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 I want to say why, is that 
even in European culture today, they, they, they greet each other with a peck on the cheek. And, and, but I, what I want us to focus on is the word holy. Not the kiss, but the holy. When we greet each other, do we greet each other in Christ in a holy way? Is it just a, a casual, like, how's it going, good, and then you just kind of move on? Or are we treating each other like we are brothers and sisters in Christ, that we have a, a, an eternal bond with each other, that we truly care for each other? As I said in the early passages, are we making those connections every time we meet that um, will facilitate the, the admonishment that may come from that, but also taking care of each other when we're struggling? How many of us know who's struggling in this room? Are we taking the time to do that? Are we really seeing the value that every one of us is made in the image of God and that we need to treat each other in that way, in a holy way? Are we greeting each other that way? And that could be a hug, which is more common in our culture, or, or a handshake, but it's really the heart of it. It's the holiness that we're looking at. And if you want to kiss me, I'll, I'll accept it, just probably not on the lips. And um, uh, uh, If God is calling us to do this, I'll do it. I just need to brush my teeth and, and get some, um, uh, chap my lips and all that, yeah. But I'll, I'll do what God calls me to do, but I believe this is cultural. And, uh, and I, I, I just want the heart of it, that we are greeting each other in a holy way, loving each other. So... I love this one. This one I'm so excited about. I didn't know I was going to get to do this. So I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. I didn't know I was under an oath, and I just fulfilled it. I just read this to all of you. I fulfilled an oath. That's so cool. So uh, I can check that off. Now it's all your guys' turn. Go read this to your brothers. And so it's a short book. I, I think you can get through it pretty quickly. R read it to someone in your world. And then it closes with, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And he greeted us with the grace, and he's saying goodbye with the grace. That th that's what this is all about. That's what church is about. That's what every book in the Bible is about, is the grace of Jesus Christ. Without Jesus' uh, grace, uh, we have nothing. It's because he had the grace on us, that he loved us so much that he would die for us, that we can turn to this book and find life, find meaning and purpose in life, and knowing that there's a future, that Jesus' grace is how uh, we, we start our lives and how we, uh, when we know him, we will end our lives, that we will meet him in paradise because of his grace. So in conclusion, uh, the, today's takeaways and kind of the takeaways for the whole book, but... Um, what is my attitude towards other believers? When I come to church next Sunday and uh, we're having communion, can I do it uh, with uh, my conscience, uh, with, with the Holy Spirit approving, or will he be convicting me throughout this week, hopefully, so that I can make it right? Will he convict me and saying, you can't take communion until you talk to that person. You can't take communion before you get this right. And that could be in, uh, the, the leaders, the elders and the pastors, or just someone in, in the congregation that something's just off and you need to make it right. So ask yourself, what is my attitude towards other believers right now? And how can I make it pleasing to God? Next is, what is my attitude towards God? Am I approaching him with groaning and complaining in my prayers? Or am I thankful? Even when life is difficult, even when things aren't going my way, am I going to God in prayer in thanksgiving and gratitude, saying, Lord, I'm, I'm scared right now. This is hard. I'm hurting. But I'm so grateful that you are a good God who loves me, who's going to get me through this, and ultimately I will be with you in paradise. And these moments are just small, fleeting moments that mean nothing in eternity. And uh, can, can we do that? It, are we committing our hearts to that, to go to him in thanksgiving and praise? And also recognizing his Holy Spirit working in us. Uh, what do prophecies look like? What am I on the lookout for as Jesus is returning? Am I testing every spirit? Am I testing every preacher? Am I testing uh, everything, uh, someone who calls himself a believer? Am I testing what they're saying to see if it's Holy Spirit filled or there's just man in there somewhere? I I am I relating uh, constantly in prayer 
with what's being said to me and seeing if it stacks up to Scripture. And finally, just kind of an overview for the whole book, what am I going to do? If this is your first week here or if you've been through the whole series, um, what, is God, what has the Holy Spirit been saying to you? What do you need to do? What, what do you need to get right in your life? What do you need to study more? Are, are you prepared for Jesus' return, which is the ultimate point of this book, is that Jesus is coming back. And we can look forward to that. We're excited about that, but we also want to be prepared. And what do I need to do to be prepared for that? So that's where we'll close the, the book of 1 Thessalonians. I'm still looking forward to doing 2 Thessalonians in seven years. So I hope you'll join me for that. Uh, let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, Lord, and it is a word that should be read to all the brothers, Lord, that uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord, that we would go into our worlds and read this to them, to share what we've taken away from it, Lord. Uh, we know your word does not return void, so Lord, I pray that we would, um, we would take uh, what you have taught us and apply it to our lives, Lord. We thank you so much for all that you're doing in our lives, in our church, in our worlds, Lord, and ultimately, we are so looking forward to your return. In Jesus' name, amen.